Hello, welcome to our webinar, How to Identify Your Target Market and All the Reasons Why You Should. A special welcome and thank you to our presenter, Brenda Kiliansky. Brenda is part of the New York Small Business Development Center Library staff, known as the Research Network, which offers free library and research services to all New York SBDC clients through our New York SBDC Business Advisors. I am your moderator, Renee Goodno, also from the New York SBDC. A quick note, our services are made possible by the U.S. Small Business Administration, the state of New York, and our host campuses. If you have any questions during the webinar, please don't hesitate to type them in your questions box. We have a great crew with us today, so we will try to answer questions as they come in, but if we miss any, we will circle back during our closing Q&A. Today's webinar slides are available to download in the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel. The slides and today's recording will also be emailed out to attendees shortly after the webinar. And with that, I will turn controls over to you, Brenda. Well, thank you, Renee, and welcome to the SBDC webinar, How to Identify Your Target Market and All the Reasons Why You Should. Uh, as Renee mentioned, I'm Brenda Kiliansky, a librarian with the SBDC Research Network located in Albany, New York, and I'll be taking you on a tour of the hows and whys of target markets. And just a note before we begin, I did make the PowerPoint available as a three-slide handout to everyone who registered. Uh, and you may have gotten that earlier, um, so you could take notes during the presentation. Um, I also updated the slides, and so you're going to notice towards the end there's one more in there, and that revision is in that Google Drive that Renee talked about earlier. So in order to identify your target market, you'll need to define what it is and, just as importantly, what it isn't. What is a target market? Simply put, a target market is a specific group of people you have decided to target with your products or services. A target market is not everyone. But why is this distinction important? Is it the idea to reach the most amount of people possible? I know, you want your business to be the next Amazon. Okay, be like Amazon, be smart and target. Remember, Amazon was not always all things to everyone. For four years, between 1994 and 1998, Amazon just sold books. And even then, they did it online only, which in 1994 was an extremely niche audience as the internet was still relatively new. Remember 14.4 modems? Only when Amazon had established itself it's as a solid customer base, did the company start expanding its product base, its customer base, its mission? So remember, you're Amazon in 1994, not 2020. In Jim Collins' 2011 bestseller, Great by Choice, Uncertainty, Chaos, and Luck, Why Some Thrive Despite Them All, seven companies were profiled for the outstanding performance over the span of three decades. The companies represented multiple industries, computer software, insurance, medical technology, and airlines. The company, which consistently outranked their closest competitor more than 10 times, showed a profit every single year and within the most volatile of industries was Southwest Airlines. Now just think of everything that slammed the airline industry from 1972 to 2002. Fuel shocks, deregulation, labor strife, air traffic controller strikes, crippling recession, interest rate spikes, hijackings. And in 2001, the terrorist attacks of September 11th. And yet, if you'd invested $10,000 in Southwest Airlines on December 31st, 1972, when it was just a tiny little outfit with three airplanes, your $10,000 would have grown to nearly 12 million by the end of 2002, a return 63 times better than the general stock market. It's a better performance than Walmart, better than Intel, better than GE, better than Johnson & Johnson, better than Walt Disney. In fact, according to an analysis by Money Magazine, Southwest Airlines produced the number one return of investment of all S&P 500 companies that were publicly traded in 1972 and held for a full 30 years to 2002. So how did Southwest Airlines grow from three planes to the industry leader it remains today? It specifically targeted its market, in this case, business travelers, and not just all business travelers, but business travelers from Texas. And just like Amazon, which didn't expand its business beyond online book selling for several years, Southwest managed its growth and targeted a market they knew they could sustain. Southwest didn't expand outside Texas until nearly eight years after starting service, making a small jump to New Orleans. 
Southwest moved outward from Texas in deliberate steps, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Albuquerque, Phoenix, and Los Angeles, and didn't reach the Eastern seaboard until almost a quarter of a century after its founding. In 1996, more than 100 cities clamored for Southwest service. And how many cities did Southwest open that year? Four. Now, I didn't pick Southwest Airlines as a random example, but as a model for how a fledgling company chose a target market and grew their company by consistently focusing on that target. Southwest also serves as an excellent example of how a company grew its market by also focusing on a fundamental principle. So let's look at Southwest's current model. motto. Transparency, low fares, nothing to hide, that's transparency. If you've flown Southwest Airlines before, you'll know they structure their ticket prices in three tiers. Business select, anytime, want to get away. And Southwest is quite transparent with regards to the benefits a passenger receives depending on the type of ticket purchase. You can see from the screenshot how the benefits compare between want to get away, anytime, and business select including rapid rewards points, priority boarding, and the always popular complimentary premium drink. And keep thinking about that word benefit as we look at another company that's had a little success over the years, Apple. In the fall of 2001, hard to believe it's almost 20 years ago, Apple founder and CEO Steve Jobs introduced the world to the first iPod. The main feature of the iPod was that it could store five gigabytes of MP3 files. But Apple didn't promote that feature. Instead, it promoted the benefit that this feature provided. 1,000 songs in your pocket. So whether it's Apple or Southwest or Amazon or any other business, big or small, understand that they're not selling a product or a service as much as they're selling a need or a benefit. So when you're looking to target your market, you need to answer, the most important question, what do my customers want? What do my customers need? Okay, so you have this great product, a terrific service, and perhaps you've already scheduled a meeting with an SBDC advisor, trying to figure out how to match your new business to an equally new market. And you know now that your market isn't everyone, right? So what do you do next? What seems like an obvious question, but one that still needs a specific answer is, do you know your industry, uh, do you know what industry your business falls under? Do you know this for certain? Because knowing your industry is essential as you look to target your market. How so? Well, chances are your customers might be very different whether you're brewing beer or roasting coffee, whether you run an assisted living facility or offer in-home healthcare services or opening a full service sit down restaurant or buying a drive in franchise. At the research network, we're often asked by SBDC business advisors to get industry trends for a client. One of the first things we look for is the NAICS code. NAICS stands for North American Industry Classification System, a six digit code that replaced the earlier four digit standard industrial classification or SIC code. NAICS is the standard used by federal statistical agencies in classifying business establishments for the purpose of collecting, analyzing, and publishing statistical data related to the U.S. business economy. That data is essential to your business as well. So how important is it to understand the industry you're in? Well, let's say you've decided to open a restaurant and you've set an appointment to see an advisor at your local SBDC. One of the first things you might be asked is, what kind of restaurant? fine dining or fast food. And you might not think this matters all that much, but think again. You can see on the screen that I've searched the NAICS database supported by census.gov. Notice I've retrieved 25 records when I searched on the keyword restaurant, and each record is assigned a different NAICS code. Full service restaurants is listed as 722511, while drive-in restaurants is categorized as 722513. If you look at this slide, you can see this category covers several kinds of restaurants, like diner, diners, donut shops, fine dining restaurants, and pizza parlors. While if we look at the next slide, 
you can see the various types of restaurants that fall under this category, including carry-out restaurants, drive-in restaurants, sandwich shops with limited service and takeout eating places. So at this point, I know you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with finding my target market? Well, a lot actually. And as I'm a big proponent of not reinventing the wheel, I want to show you how understanding what industry category your business falls under will help you find your target market that much faster. Remember, I mentioned earlier how federal agencies use the NAICS code for purposes of collecting, analyzing, and publishing statistical data. Well, that data is more often than not available to users outside the government. So if you are planning on opening up a restaurant that falls under the NAICS code 722511, chances are pretty good that some organization has compiled an industry report that includes the kind of information you need on your target market. These are just two samples of the kinds of industry reports that are available for NAICS code 722511 full service restaurants. If you're looking for market trends and demographic profiles, an industry report from Dun & Bradstreet or an IBIS World report can be a great starting point to understanding your target market. And the best part about this is much of the research has always been, already been compiled. You just have to decide how it applies to your own business. But industry reports alone won't help you identify and reach your target market. First, you have to understand that the target market can be segmented into several parts. Finding your target market is an, in an age of information overload is less complicated when you approach your potential market in segments. Refining your target market via market segmentation will also allow you to better match your products or services benefits to your customers' needs. The five segments are demographic, behavioral, psychographic, geographic, and sociographic. Demographics are usually what most people think about when they hear target market. And that's not surprising as any good industry report will usually provide a comprehensive demographic profile of a market above all else. Demographics include the following subcategories, age, gender, family size, household income, occupation, level of education, religion, race, and nationality. The second market segment is behavioral, and that includes the following subcategories, benefits, sought, buyer readiness, degree of loyalty to a brand or product, you know, those people who only drive Subarus, user status, and occasions. Psychographic categories include personality, attitude, personal values, lifestyle, social class, activities, interests, opinions, and values might include purchasing only green products or those not tested on animals. While the geographic categories include content, country, country region, city, cities and towns of a specific population density, climate, areas with special population thresholds, and localized areas, neighborhoods, specific retail outlets as examples. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later on about a particular neighborhood um, and how that's played a part in the success or failure of some businesses. Lastly, uh, in the sociographic segment, categories include personal needs, personal profile, personal attitudes, social graphs and friends, and personal passions. And, and I should add here that we at the Research Network often get requests for a combination of these segments. So for example, we could be asked to provide a three ring study of five, 10 and 15 miles for a specific location that includes full demographics, consumer expenditure reports and daily traffic patterns. This is definitely something that we get when somebody's opening or perhaps buying a, a restaurant. So what, what are you supposed to do with this market segmentation? How will this help you target a market. Perhaps you dream about opening up a yoga studio in a small college town in upstate New York. Who might your target be? You meet with your SBDC business advisor and after your consultation, your advisor makes a request to the research network for an industry report on yoga and alternative therapies. You receive your report and you realize you have two distinct markets for your services. Socially conscious millennials, and health conscious baby boomers. And you can see from this table that each segment of the market is reflected, demographics, behavioral, psychographic, geographic, sociographic, but they're also quite different for each target market. 
And just you can take a look here, the age is completely different. Millennials, only 20% of them are married as opposed to 40% of boomers were married at the same time than they were the millennials age. The wealth is really different, and, and I want you to bring this to that, where you see 4% of the U.S. household wealth is held by socially conscious millennials, as opposed to 54% in health conscious baby boomers. Think about that later for another example I'm going to show you. Uh, so how would identifying these differences help your marketing? You'll be matching your product or service, in this case a yoga studio, to their different needs and benefits. So now you've done your research and you're ready to target both markets with advertising. Perhaps you'll develop two separate campaigns that might look something like the following. Socially conscious millennials and health conscious baby boomers, a better you for a better planet, better for your heart, better for your wallet. Notice here that neither talks about the actual yoga studio either its hours or its fee structures, but how the yoga studio can fulfill those needs of its markets. And remember, this is just one example created by a business librarian, not a marketing ex executive, I should add. But I wanna present the idea here that you can have the same product or service mean very different things to many different types of people. And the closer you can match them, the greater the gains for your business. I want to briefly discuss the differences between target market and target audience. In a lot of the research I pulled for clients, I'll see the terms used interchangeably in various articles. And while the terms are similar and to some extent overlapping in meeting, there are key differences between them, mostly related to the practical implications each has on your business. So in, consider, in consideration of our time today, the most simplistic way to understand these differences are as follows. A target market impacts all decisions a small business makes, while a target audience only impacts decisions related to specific marketing messages. Target markets are usually comprised of the end user of a product or service. Target audiences may or may not be the end user of a product or service. And probably the best example for understanding the target market, target audience dynamic is to look at the ubiquitous McDonald's Happy Meal. McDonald's clearly creates the Happy Meal to serve their target market made up of children. However, they create their advertisement promoting the Happy Meal aimed at their target audience of parents who have all the purchasing power. Children care more about the toy, not the meal while parents care more about the nutrition, certainly the demographic of today's parents. So what does this mean in terms of targeted advertising? Well, you get two very different ads for one thing. If you look at our advertisement geared towards our target market, you'll see the following. Great games, great toys, great choices. But notice that you never see any picture or mention of food just a container of milk in the background. Meanwhile, the advertisement geared towards our target audience never mentions toys or games, but it does mention calories, ingredients, fresh healthy choices, apple slices or yogurt. Yum, just what every child craves. But you can see perfectly how the target market and the target audience do not overlap. That's not to say one can't be a subset of the other. As another example, let's go back to our yoga studio, or in this case, a company that manufactures clothing for people who might frequent a yoga studio. This company based on the West Coast has created a yoga legging brand that has identified its main target market of single women ages 24 to 34 who frequent, regularly frequent gyms and have demonstrated an interest in yoga. In this case, the target market will be the same as the target audience. However, you could still refine that same audience either even further. Their Instagram users who also happen to follow accounts such as Yoga Girl and Yoga Inspiration, who have also recently purchased products online, live in Portland, Oregon, and value fair trade products. So in this case, the target audience is a subset of the target market. I like this example because it takes into account some of the things I discussed earlier about market segmentation. 
uh, demographics, in this case, single women between ages of 24 and 34, behavioral, these women shop online, psychographic, they value fair trade products, geographic, they live in Portland, Oregon, as opposed to Poughkeepsie, New York, sociographic, they follow very specific Instagram accounts geared towards yoga enthusiasts. When I was reviewing the presentation last night, I realized I concentrated more on how identifying your target market is a stepping stone for success. But I believe it's also important to understand how identifying your target market is also a smart way to avoid failure, which might be more important. And I wanna share a local anecdote to illustrate the point. Uh, this is a map of uh, the Center Square neighborhood of Albany, New York, and I, I don't know how many people listening in um, are familiar with the area, uh, but you can see uh, the P Washington Park uh, to the west side of the map, and then to the lower right-hand side is the Capitol and a little bit of the Empire State Plaza uh, that's uh, peeking out. Uh, but if you notice that cross street uh, that's going from uh, northeast to southwest, uh, that yellow street is Lark Street. And is, I actually live in that neighborhood. And it's very interesting to see uh, the demographics and the changes and also the business successes and failures. And it's really the failures I, I wanted to concentrate on a little bit. Uh, when I first lived in this neighborhood about 30 years ago, and I'm really dating myself here, I was going to graduate school. Uh, I was actually sort of in the minority in terms of the age group. Um, most of the people who were moving into that area were older boomers, older than me. They were probably between the ages of 35 and 45. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. And they were basically build, uh, buying up all these old buildings that had been, you know, I think constructed in 1800s, early 1900s, brownstones. They got a lot of grant money, rehabbed the place up, and they really did a wonderful job in reinventing the neighborhood. But again, that, that demographic skewed older. Well, what's happened in the last 30 years is that they've moved out, retired, what have you, and their kids now live there, so it's the millennials. If you look at Lark Street, you'll see quite a few restaurants and there are a lot of boutiques. Lark Street is a, is a magnet for art. There's uh, art on Lark. There is the Lark Fest in the fall, which brings people from all over New York State. And so it's, it's really, there's high traffic all the time. You've also got people coming in from Empire State Plaza who are working downtown, myself included. Uh, so you would expect tremendous success. Uh, and there are businesses that have been there forever. Uh, but the problem is, if you look towards the top of the screen at where the injunction between Lark Street and Washington Avenue, that cross street at the top, those three blocks have probably the worst restaurant failure I have ever seen in the city of Albany. Um, we're probably running at about a 70 to 80 percent failure rate. And I've been thinking a lot as I've been working on this project, why is that happening? And I think Part of it is the, the people who are building, who are owning restaurants, who are opening them up, uh, sometimes they're buying them and re, uh, changing the brand a little bit, continue to think of the model that the people who live there are the people that lived there 30 years ago and that they have a lot of purchasing power. Remember that uh, graph I showed you earlier about the socially conscious millennials versus the health conscious boomers. The health conscious boomers had 50%, 54% of the purchasing power. They don't live there anymore. They're living in Saratoga. They're living in Clifton Park. And most of the restaurants that are open five, six months are failing because they're not addressing the fact that they think, hey, we've got a great restaurant, but they're not meeting the needs of the people who actually live in this in this neighborhood. Uh, if you'll notice at sort of at the corner of State and Lark, there is something called Season Skate Shop. And that's exactly what it is. It's for skateboarders. Uh, they're the most annoying people I've ever met in my life. They just like skateboard all over the city, go against the traffic in, you know, in front of cars, but they pretty much own that block. And they've been in business forever. You can see skateboarders hang out there until the store opens. And about six months ago, we had this beautiful chocolate shop open next door. And my thought was, why are they moving in there? Nobody's going to buy. Certainly skateboarders aren't going to buy chocolate bonbons. And sure enough, six months later, there was a sign on that store saying, we're moving up to Clifton Park. 
And my thought was, why didn't they think about this before they opened? And this is kind of where I'm going with the idea of targeting your market, not only for your successes, but to avoid failures. So many of these restaurants on Lark Street that are closing are not understanding they're not going to meet the needs of the people who live in this neighborhood. And that's really key. Uh, and again, look just on the flip side of things where uh, you'll see uh, places like if, you, if you're walk, driving down a highway and there's a Home Depot, you'll notice halfway down the street, there's a Lowe's. Or if you see a Joann's, it's probably next to a Michael's or a Hobby Lobby. That's actually good business because they're probably complementing where the, the purchasers are going. I know when I'm a crafter, if I can't find something at Joann's, I'll go around the corner to Hobby Lobby. Um, Albany has uh, had a L.L. Bean, which has been probably, I think, almost as successful as the flagship store in, um, in Maine. And it's been there almost 20 years. They have a great uh, customer base. They offer classes across all of the capital region. And about three months ago, Albany Business Review uh, had an article in there saying that um, REI is going to open literally 400 feet away in the Colony Center in the old abandoned Sears building. And a lot of people were saying, that's crazy. And actually, that's smart because they already know that's a good place for people who buy outdoor clothing. And then because REI actually purchases, has more emphasis on equipment, a lot of those people buying equipment are gonna walk down the aisle at Colony Center and then go to all uh, L.L. Bean and buy their clothes for the, to go with their canoe. I think it's actually pretty smart. Uh, but that's definitely a place where targeting, we're looking at your target market is important, not for the success, but for the failure. Um, and I wish that the city of Albany had asked me this before they opened up new restaurants. So um, I realize I've packed a lot of information about target markets into one presentation, and I understand that there is much more here to digest, but I want to consider that uh, just preparation for a long journey is what I'm pro probably giving you right now. So where to next? Whether you have already visited your local SBDC and met with an advisor, you are seriously thinking about making that first scheduled appointment, uh, please note that you can obtain a lot of the information discussed today as it relates to your own businesses with assistance from the SBDC Research Network. Uh, and just a sampling, we can help provide the following. Uh, we can identify local com competitors, uh, and certainly we can get you information on their sales and where they're located and um, again, I don't think the people on Lark Street did any of this. Uh, we can offer ring studies providing demographic information, tables and maps showing consumer spending habits, finding relevant trade association or regulatory contacts, uh, locating articles written about ventures similar to yours, providing financial norms and ratios for your industry, and conducting preliminary patent or trademark searches. I just wanted to draw your attention to the map here that lists all 22 campus-based centers and outreach offices across New York State. Each link will bring you to the individual page of a local SBDC and provides full contact information. So what should you do next in search of your target market? Find us on the internet at www.nysbdc.org. Visit your local New York SBDC meet with a business advisor, and remember, as Renee mentioned earlier, Research Network services are free to all New York SBDC clients. And uh, first, I would like to thank you for sitting through this, and I'm sure there's questions, so I'm gonna hand the reins back over to Renee. Thank you, Brenda. I'm just replying to a couple um, that were asking about the locations. Um, so I'm sending mm -hmm. our main website link there to all of the audience members, mm -hmm. and then I will send the locations one. But um, if there's other questions, definitely type them into your questions panel right now, uh, and we will answer those as they come in. Um, we have a couple folks that mentioned they definitely need to make an appointment. Um, they didn't oh, realize good. the research network services were available through mm -hmm. their SBDC advisors. For this one, I. I would recommend you schedule an in-person appointment so you can meet with your advisor and then discuss what type of research the research network could help with. 
This question is for you, Brenda. What is the best way to identify your target audience when you already have customers? Well, first of all, I probably, I mean, I would just think off the top of your, if you know what you're, if you've got a restaurant already, you need to identify like what kind of restaurant it is. I'm curious to know what the business is actually. Let me ask. Okay. One of the questions, if you if you need to be a client to get research, our services are free to all New York State residents, but you do have to go through a business advisor. What the business advisor will do is they will look at what your business is and kind of give you a rundown on what the research network can provide in terms of research information. So then they contact our librarians and they go through and they put together a report and then they share that with the advisor who then goes over it with the client. So you do have to be an SBDC client. Can I um, re go back to answering that other question a little bit? Absolutely. Okay, I'm actually going to, if I can, I'm going to scroll back to, um, if there's a way, I'm actually going to go to this, just a minute. This is going to be a little easier. This was actually from uh, census.gov. There is, anybody could go into this site, which is the North American Industry Classification System, and I literally just put in, I just, there's a keyword restaurant in there, uh, whatever the industry is, and you can put keywords in and it will, if it's not exactly what it is, it will give you examples of like what it might be or see also this, or it could be this. And it ha that might be one way to identify an industry. Sounds good. And I haven't gotten an answer yet on the type of business. Okay. I was thinking too, to answer that question a little bit further, I had a, had a request a couple of months ago and it was a retail shop that handled um, spy equipment, you know, the kind of thing like, you know, your cameras, whatnot, that, you know, for people who are either in the, the investigative business or maybe people just wanted to have it in their, maybe it's industrial espionage or what, ha what have you, but it was a retail shop for this kind of equipment. When I was, I think the person was looking for um, competitors in the area, what I happen to notice is when we usually get a request in, um, there's always a NAICS code that people identify, that they're identified with their business. And interestingly enough, when I was pulling up a list of competitors, I didn't see this person's own business listed on there because they were actually listed with a different code and probably the incorrect one. And I actually had mentioned that to the advisor that if somebody's looking for them, because they were listed as a detective agency, which they were not. And so that would be another reason you'd want to make sure, because if somebody was looking for, you know, hey, I'm looking for businesses like this, they weren't even in their own category. We had a question, what the best office for research is in Western New York area. All of our SVT centers throughout New They're York State great. actually use our, they are all great, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they all use our central library staff that's located in Albany. Mm -hmm. um, so no matter which center you're working with, you'll have access to the same research staff um, at our main office. Mm -hmm. What would be a dog training company code? That's a really good question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. Uh, let me go back to that. I've just kind of messed that up. I would have to go into the search. I know if you type in dog, there's there's listings for kennels. They're listing for training because we get quite a few. I've actually had a ton of searches in the last couple of months uh, throughout New York State for people who want to either open up um, uh, dog sitting service, kennel. So the, what you'll do is if you put the code in, the keyword there, and if you can't do it, don't worry, you can always go, when you go to see an advisor, they'll work with you on that as well. Because usually that well, we'll get it and if there's, we need to make any refining, but you know, just on your own, if you needed to know, but you just type in dog, you'll find it like a ton of different things for that. We have a couple more questions rolling in, rolling in. On, sure. on the codes. Yep. Um, and really if you thing. cannot find it on the website, I definitely would recommend asking a business advisor. Um, and then if, if they're not sure if they need to triple check, they'll, they'll contact our library staff. Okay. One question was, how do you approach reaching an online target audience? Well, I would, the first thing, I mean, again, and I, I'm going to say this, I, as not, I'm, since I'm not a marketer, but a librarian, I'm looking at it from a very different perspective. But regardless, I mean, you're still going to, whether it's online or not, I would say you're still going to look at some of the other segments, the market segments, the demographics, the geographic, that's still going to be, you know, but if you're going to, for example, remember the yoga one that we had earlier with the clothing line, uh, if you're going to target Instagram, you may want to look at what they're following. Uh, what kind of sites are they on? Uh, and again, and, and actually, Renee, you do a lot more social marketing than I do. So, I mean, I don't do any, you do it. What would you, what, do you have any suggestions on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. One way, so we um, we look at our, on the platforms that we're on, we'll look at the demographics of folks that are following us. And then from there, we, one thing that I'll do is I'll run Facebook ads to target those folks. And when within the Facebook ads manager, there's different audiences that you can test. Oh. You can test pretty much anything, but we usually will test their business interests, or if they're a small, medium size um, company, or we'll test age um, once in a while um, or location. So we do that test to test our target audience. And then once we have run an ad that's been successful with our target audience, we'll, we'll post that on our social. And we might do that in reverse as well. If we have um, a social post that's really popular within our audience, we'll turn that mm -hmm. into an ad and we'll test audiences there. But there's lots of different ways to identify your target audience online. Mm -hmm. um, HubSpot has some really great resources. They have um, a buyer persona kind of worksheet that you could work on. And that, that would be a really good resource for you to work on your on online target audience. I know you and I were talking the other day about how when you were advertising this, you said you didn't get as much, you didn't get as many hits with Twitter as you did when you sent an email blast. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. Our email marketing campaigns do significantly better than our social campaigns in mm -hmm. terms of advertising webinars. Um, and it's great to see what the open rates are, to see what folks mm -hmm. are interested in. You can also track the click-through rates. Um, you can do a lot of cool stuff. You can definitely track that, a lot of that stuff on social, but email is very straightforward. Um, and it's, it's definitely one of the online devices that we use frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions, as you mentioned, the SIT code for businesses, what is that? Okay, this was the older version of uh, the NAICS code, and SIC is still used for, I think, mostly in Europe um, and internationally. Um, I will tell you myself, though, oftentimes, um, if you look at the NAICS codes, and actually my colleague just walked in who was listening in and said, if you, for the person who was looking for uh, the pet and the dog things, if you're looking for dogs under NAICS, you could put dog in there, but it will come out with pet care except veterinary services. So it kind of cross, uh, there's sort of a cross reference there. But one of the things with the NAICS codes is that I think they tend to be a little bit more general, but those are the categories which the agencies are using to compile this information. There have been times though, that when I go into one of, we have a database where I pull, maybe I need contact information or competitor information on, uh, let's just say, well, we'll just say uh, dog pounds in Binghamton, New York. When you use the SIT codes, they tend to be a little bit more specific. In ter they, they don't just encompass everything. Or for example, maybe I have somebody that was doing aromatherapy. Well, aromatherapy is going to be under the alternative healthcare NAICS code. So it's going to pull everything up, including massage, uh, Reiki, what have you. But the SICK code may just be for aromatherapy or Reiki. And so sometimes it will just narrow it that much more. And so, so I have used the others um, when, I, when I, I'm not getting the, the correct amount of hits uh, as well. You know, unfortunately, they're one of my, my favorite searches lately. I've had a couple of people that want to open up axe throwing bars. I'm not kidding, but drinking and axe throwing, I'm not sure if that's such a good idea, but it's becoming a trend. And there is no code for either one at this point. So uh, it's really difficult to, to search on that. All right, so this one came in. They're curious how to find out about patent services. Um, they also wanna meet with the SBDC um, to, f to find an advisor um, to get a good mentor. They're wondering how they should go about this. In terms of getting, th your first mentor probably is gonna be your, your business advisor that you s set up with. But for, as far as other mentors in general, and I'm going to, this is actually a really good question because it's something that when I do research, for, especially for people starting in businesses, one of the things that I, I, I usually put in a research packet is information on trade uh, uh, professional associations uh, that are in line with the, the particular business. Uh, because, and it's really worth spending the annual membership fee on one of those members because you can get mentors through those professional associations and you can network like crazy. 
And that's something that goes way beyond what we do at SBDC, but it's very specific to your profession and your industry. Recently, I think I had um, had somebody who was wanting to become a wedding consultant and do wedding planner and wanted to have somebody that could advise them and it, joining an association of wedding consultants, and there is, there's an association for pretty much anything, that's really helpful. Associations too can provide information that even we can't get to. And probably the single best I can think of is golf courses. Um, we've had a couple of people who want to manage or own golf courses in the state of New York. And golfing is a very high end profession. There's a lot of money in there. And there is a golf association that produces some major statistics, but it is only available to members of that association. It's something we'll never get, uh, we usually never can get a handle on. So those associations. And again, regarding um, the trademarks, that's just something if you need to find something and you can put a request in, we can do a search for it. Perfect. And we have a response to what type of business it is. Mm -hmm. And it's a nail salon. They purchased from the previous owners. So there is a good customer base, but slowing okay. down because of competition. Okay. All right. So I'm actually putting in nail salon. So I can tell you, I just actually went into the NAICS code. So there is actually a NAICS code for nail salons, which is 812113. So somebody could run, they could, you know, ask for reports on that. The other thing that I might suggest is if you're going to go see an SBDC advisor, we could put a, you know, a request in for competitors in the area and we can see what kind of business there is across that, that area. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Couple more questions. I'm trying to connect with a probate estate attorney. Does the library have information on that? That's a good question. I guess if it's relating to your business, I'm sure we could find, I mean, we do find attorneys all the time. I mean, I know we've done that in the past. I mean, it's a list of attorneys in a particular area, whether or not it's actually going to list, I think it probably will list. Uh, there's also something I can say right now, there's a free service called or Martindale, which you can go online to Martindale and you can find attorneys that way. It used to be not free, but now you can go in and search it. And one note on that too, a lot of our centers will keep track of services in the area, like attorneys and accountants that are in the area. They're not preferred, but we just try to keep track of those resources for folks. So you could definitely reach out to the center closest to you to see if they have a list that they could share with you mm -hmm. as well. So are there any resources for marketing strategy once target market and audience is identified? Oh, yeah, that's actually the second, a lot of times the second step that when you meet with a research with when you meet with a, a business advisor that will often get that question that can we get that marketing strategies and hopefully it's not just the general ones, but specific to uh, a particular industry and we get we give that information out all the time. We search on that. I think you answered this one already, but I'm going to ask it again. Mm -hmm. How do you request an industry report? I'm a past client who doesn't currently have an open case. You can go back into see your advisor. Um, we've had people who've opened up their cases again, visit, and that they could go through the research network and we can, we can get an industry report. I would like to know if the market information today can help me with my company. I have a dog training company, not sure how to start the research for my company. If you have a, I mean, even if you have a company already, you can always ask for the industry report. You can look at uh, competitors in the area to see if there are far too many dog businesses in an area or not enough. Uh, you can look at traffic reports too. Um, you know, I, I tend to see them more for restaurants, but one of the things that we can pull up is, you know, we can look at a particular location cross streets and neighborhood, what have you, like Lark Street, like I showed, and we can get daily traffic reports. So we can see, are, is anybody even coming that way? You know, this, that kind of thing. This person's opening a sign shop, doing banners, feather flags, storefront signage, et cetera. What would be my target market and what location would be best to open a storefront? I'm in the Buffalo, New York area. I couldn't answer that offhand. I would, that's actually a research question that I would Yeah, it's a very detailed you know, question as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, I really could not, I could not know that offhand. I would have, yeah. that would actually be a, like, that would go to the, that would go, you know, from your advisor to a research network and we'd have to be able to answer that. To that one, I'm going to shoot over the make an appointment mm -hmm. um, option and definitely would recommend that for that question. Mm -hmm. Is there a person in the Buffalo, Niagara area that is an expert on target market? Offhand, I can't say I know that. Um, I'm sure there is somebody 
in the there's because a lot of the business advisors have had experience either in marketing. I know that there are some who are in startups, you know, very specific industries. Probably what I would do is get in touch with the main office in Buffalo and uh, the large and probably talk to somebody there. Absolutely, because they might um, again have a list of someone who's an expert yeah. on that in the area. Yeah. For sure. Do you have available market research studies such as BCC to get commercial market research data, not just public data? Yeah. Do you have available market research studies such as BCC to get commercial market research data, not just public data? I think it depends on some of the industries. I know we've had things that, you know, um, like the coffee industry where we've purchased it or bed, bed you know, bed and breakfast. I think it, it it's not just the stuff from the like this typical databases that we have we have had some individual ones i think i have to know which ones you know specific industry um like i said with like for example golf certain ones we can get and other ones it has to go right to the uh, association and it has to be members only we try really hard to get what we can get i think we're really good my my colleagues and i are, i think really work hard to try to get as much as we can how long does it typically take to get research questions answered by the research <laughs> network? Okay, I'm going to laugh here. We're really good at what we do. Uh, we're uh, Usually it's about a th two to three week turnaround. Uh, we there's I have two colleagues who are amazing and they've actually been here longer than I am, have been here. Uh, and um, they're just amazing. We're a little swamped right now and probably they're a little swamped because I've been working on this webinar for a while. Uh, but it's usually about three weeks. You know, sometimes if it's a, it's an absolute request, we can push it up. But you know, if somebody's meeting to do a pitch a following Monday, we'll we'll put it up there. But it's usually about a three week turnaround. We had a question: if you have suggestions for accountants that cater to small businesses, and that would definitely again be a question you'd want to connect with an SPD center mm -hmm. um, in your area specifically, yeah. so that you can see if they have a list of those. Mm -hmm. We we won't make a suggestion, um, but we have we typically have a list of what's available. Mm -hmm. Are there any events where we collaborate with other agencies? For example, I provide security services, monitoring, and NYSERDA runs programs for new technology companies. Can we leverage this through the SBDC? You know, that's probably a center question. Like, in other words, I would talk to the closest center to find out whether they do that kind of thing. That's kind of off out of my wheelhouse because I'm just doing the research. I don't kind of make those connections, if that makes sense. Do you also provide research concerning buying a franchise? Yeah, we do actually. Um, I mean, I've had a couple of those questions that come through. They're, you know, franchise of a particular kind of restaurant or or what have you. In fact, the axe throwing one that there's a franchise. If you want, if anybody's interested in buying an axe throwing business, they're very popular in New Jersey and Long Island right now, apparently. And uh, yes, so we will give the, you know, some very specific things on just the general what you need to do to buy a franchise versus that particular franchise, we might be able to um, get you that information. Someone was having trouble finding the code for executive coaching and leadership. Because it's probably not exactly that term. See, when I put in the word coaching, I get doula services. So that's probably not what you want. Sometimes this is where librarians come in handy because we deal with the keywords. And let's see. I might use a SIT code then instead. Well, probably the closest I'm seeing right now, and this is where the 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 terms tend to be a little too broad, but at least it's a starting point, is the term I used executive management services or executive, and it comes up under the general office administrative services. And that encompasses a lot. And sometimes you're gonna come up with those kind of terms, um, but we can we can still get industry reports on that, and we may be able to like segment down a little farther. We had mm -hmm. someone ask how they can find out if they're a client of the SBDC, and I suggested they call our central office. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this person's researching for a safari company going to Kenya, and it will be online. And they're looking for suggestions on on where to start in their research. Are they looking to buy a company, or are they looking to just go on a safari? I think they are looking to start a safari company. Okay. Um, going to Kenya that folks can register online for mm -hmm. the safari. I might look to see if there are any associations. Of, and in fact, I, I'm sure there are. I don't know the ones off the top of my head, but I, I know that there are like travel agents, uh, international. I don't know the exact title, but they are travel consultants. And so I know a couple of months ago, I had a search about somebody who wanted to start 
travel tours to India. And I know that I gave them a couple of links to different travel associations that work with people in the professions. And that okay. might be a starting point. Yeah, it, again, it kind of sounds like a nice project to sit down um, yeah, with someone with, to kind of map exactly. out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone wants to know why the codes are so important um, and what else they can use them for. Well, I think they're important in terms of just getting some of those reports and, and the, especially the, dem, uh, the statistical data. Uh, I, I've noticed, for example, uh, I've done a lot of research in the last couple of months on agriculture uh, in New York, dairy farms, uh, for one or for beer industry. And oftentimes, and it's not just the federal level, but at the state level, a lot of those reports are attached to that code. So you can get a lot of information there. And it's not just, you know, this number of the market is going is is purchasing this thing, but it, it's it's pretty detailed. And and I it's just really good. It's because there is a difference. If you look, if you go back to the the, the PowerPoint earlier when I let me go back to um, this here. If you look at that NAICS code, you can see that now, the keyword search, and you see the different types of restaurants. If I um, switch over to the next one here. There is a real difference in demographics between people who are going to full dining services, uh, full service dining versus those that might be going to um, a takeout. And, and going back to the Lark Street story that I told you about with some of the restaurants that are failing, I, I wonder if some of these people who put the fine dining restaurants like Lark and Lily was one restaurant, um, Il Postino was another that died this past year. When I look at those, I'm wondering, did they not run demographics, not only just of the neighborhood, but of the businesses in general for fine dining? Who's spending it? Look at the, the socially conscious millennials who are only 4% of the purchasing power versus the 54% of the boomers. So if you're putting a fine dining restaurant in a neighborhood that where most people aren't don't have the purchasing power where you're going to lose out so those codes are really important in terms of looking at the overall industry trends and how they match up this was one that was asked earlier again uh, about being a past sbdc client mm -hmm. um seeing if they can still request an industry report from the research network and you can you just have to reopen your case with your sbdc mm -hmm. advisor and they will go ahead and do that for you so we have someone who has a burger bar and it's an established restaurant. Mm -hmm. They're wondering what the best way to attract customer to increase bar sales besides happy hour. Also how to find that target. Okay. Well, I can't give marketing advice per se because that's just not what I do. But what I might suggest is from the research perspective, um, we sometimes run demographic reports for that particular location, literally at that location, as opposed to not just the town, but literally that point. And we can look at things like daytime traffic. Um, are you getting enough people in at that time? Maybe the hours need to be different. I don't know. Uh, but I know with certain restaurants, we've looked at daytime population versus overall. Um, when we've had restaurants that are open by a college campus, that might be a really important thing. Uh, also looking at um, traffic patterns as well. And then we can look for articles on just on that very topic. You know, what, what are people doing to try to increase their business? And that's what we would try to find for you. We have a question, how to target clients by income to see where I should market in the right section of New York. Okay, I don't, I can't, I can't say how to do it, but I can find out, we can pull that information about where that location is. Like our demographic reports, the complete, you know, demographic profile will show income spending. I know consumer expenditure reports, it can be broken down. We can get the overall expenditure and then like dining, healthcare, entertainment, we can get that. You can look at how they are being spent by income. As far as how to do it, that's kind of more like the marketing part of it where you're gonna to wanna to talk to a mark, you know, a marketing excerpt, or, but we can get that information to help you make those decisions. Absolutely, and I know, so I have not tested this um, with our paid ads, but I believe I've seen, um, and others can chime in on this if they have experience, I've seen sections in those platforms where you could target folks by income. And mm -hmm. I'm, I imagine in, in Google ads, you could do that, um, cause I think I've seen it in Facebook mm -hmm. ads. Um, I know you can break down your users by right. income, um, but I, I want to say there's a way to target them too. And, and we can and we ads. can definitely pull that information in terms of, like I said, 
when I've pulled reports off uh, one of our databases will allow us to pull uh, from a region, you know, or literally within a neighborhood or a three ring. And, you know, I've had, especially a couple of clients recently have been in the healthcare industry doing aromatherapy or whatever, and I could pull or Reiki, I think was another, I can literally target that that geographic location and find out what that expenditure, what the expenditures have been. And we can do a comparison. So we know, are they more than willing to spend at alternative health care or not? So you'll have a really good sense of whether or not they're willing to do it. Okay. If I want to explore more than one business venture, is it possible to request more than one report at a time? I just did one for somebody like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it was really confusing because I think somebody wanted both a restaurant and what was the other thing? It was, I think, a printing press or something. Yeah, so two totally different things. Yes. Very cool. Definitely good because um, we were talking about mm -hmm. how they're they're in the exploring stage. Mm -hmm. So definitely good to have that data to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Would an industry report for the family care homes fall under the assisted living industry or would it have an industry of its own? family care. I'm trying to think what that would be under. Uh, I will tell you in the in the aging market, there's multiple reports. So there's in-home care. I mean, this is right off the top of my head. I don't have them all memorized. I hope, I hope nobody thinks I do because there's thousands of them. But I do know I've assisted living is its own, but those who do in-home health care, in other words, go to other people's houses, that's a different report. And there's multiple types uh, of care of elderly senior aging care. So there's more than one report is basically the answer. All right. Well, we've definitely gone over the time, so I appreciate uh, you fielding the Thank extra you. questions, no, Brenda. No Thank you for your patience. And we appreciate your time. We hope everyone has a great day.